and um, we'll look at it, and then we'll talk about where we're going to go from here. First thing we're going to do from here is shut off the light so I can see and then turn these on. You don't like that? No, it's funny because I set my, uh, set my laptop to use my external screw LCD screen. Uh-huh. What? Oh. All right, let's bring up the syllabus for this class. Um, I think it's time for them to retire this 286 machine that they have up here and, and maybe get a 486 or something. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> So do I. I, I well, I installed, I installed a, a, oh, geez, I forget the name. It's a very lean version of, a, of Ubuntu on it, just to play around. I never run Eclipse on it. So, yeah. what the heck? You know, yeah, it's a very minimal Linux distribution. And in theory, I could use it. That's probably a good idea. Yeah. I'm too old desktop. Yeah. Yeah, this is this one someone gave me. So, yeah, I just took it and wiped it and installed this. I forget the name uh, of the, the, but it's like the, it's like the smallest, um, it, it's, ex it's expressly made for like really weak computers. All right, anyhow, the syllabus in this class. This is week seven. And according to this, we ought to be doing, I believe this week, some Java review. All right? Which surprised me. I didn't think Java, I thought the next round of Java review was like later on in the semester. But, oh well. Um, yeah, this week... Week seven, we should be doing Java review, and we should have been working on the game app next week. All right. Um, we finished the game app in yeah the Canon game app right in week six. So actually, this is up here. All right. Um, we are going to review this week, but we're not going to review those particular uh, chapters because in looking at them, you folks seem to be pretty familiar with this stuff. So we're going to review something else instead in Java. If you have questions over any of that material in D through G, Appendix D through G, let me know. And I, I mean, we can handle those on a one-off. I'll talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the ideas uh, today, one of the concepts in there today. But I won't go through it like I was planning on it because, again, everyone seems to be pretty well versed in Java. Week eight, which is next week, we're going to have our second quiz. And I probably will just bump everything up unless I find another interesting topic. Now, again, this being a, you know, the first time this class is running and this being a relatively small class, you're welcome to give suggestions of stuff that you'd like to see covered that maybe isn't covered in the book, maybe I haven't covered it so far, maybe we went over it but not adequately, uh, you know, fill in the blank. Yes? Have I ever rooted my device? No. Uh, okay. No. no I, uh, it, it is essentially, um, getting rid of the safeguards uh, associated with the device and uh, giving yourself complete control over it. Becoming a super user, Becoming a super user and having complete control. Uh, folks do it like, for example, you can do it with Android devices. You, you usually hear that uh, with, with I, iPods or iPhones, rather, and they talk about jailbreaking it, which means like originally you could only use it, what, on one of the networks? And I think if you jailbroke it, you could use it on other networks. Yeah. 
and uh, in addition, you could you could you could um, install non-app store apps if you jailbroke it, which a lot of people like to do. Um, that's an option in Android to 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 install non um, non uh, app store, not not obviously the iTunes app store, but. Uh, but but to 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 uh, to install your own apps, unsigned apps. Um, so I've never felt the need to. Yeah. Yeah, you're doing the same thing. Yeah, but you but you Androids you don't have to root it. But again, that would give you super user powers. For example, one thing that that I've heard people uh, complain about is like for my phone, which I didn't bring with me. Um, comes loaded with like 15 million different stupid applications and you can't uninstall them because that's like a deal they made with Verizon to put uh, a link to Blockbuster or uh, uh, the Blockbuster app on it. So I can't get rid of the stupid Blockbuster app even though there's nothing against Blockbuster. Uh, I can't get rid of it even though I'm never going to use it. And again, it takes up space, it's annoying, you see it in the list of things. So Rooting it would allow you to go in and, and, and uninstall that app. So it gives you complete control. You can also get the Google phone or the Google tablet, and they don't have all the... Okay, they don't have that? Yeah, the, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I haven't felt the need ever to root any of them. Yeah, mine's pretty old. Mm -hmm. I know it has Bluetooth on it. Right. They don't have to use it. Ah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm amazed what what people do, though. Um, you know, um, I, I, again, there's slightly different terminologies, but I remember like when the the Xbox first came out. Like within a couple weeks, there's people running Linux on it. And how to how to install XP out of your you know it's like just this crazy stuff it's like why would you even want to do that but you know hey keeps them off the street as as my my parents would <laughs> would say all right so I'm going to start out um, so yeah if there's other topics I mean if you want to talk about that in more detail um, you know we definitely can um, I, I have to say I'm not terribly familiar with it the one topic I yeah go ahead. Yeah, this week, review those specific appendix chapters, and I'm going to be talking about some other Java things and, and Android things that uh, are mentioned in the appendixes, but, uh, or appendices, but not uh, to the degree that, that I think they should be. And then the, the spot on game then? Will probably be like week, week eight, yeah. All right, so everything gets bumped up a week. Um, but again, you know, we have some slack time. So if there's a particular topic that you want to go back and revisit or, or whatever, you know, I'll be glad to do that. One of the things that I know I mentioned to you was um, when, you're, when you're developing, you're developing one application that should be able to form right. on whatever a multitude of mm -hmm. devices right. without having to do anything. So that's one thing I want to make Okay. All right. Yeah, remind me if I, I, I think I have that in my notes of, of, of a thing to do, but uh, remind me if like more time goes by and, and we don't talk about it. And I'd also at some point, I'm curious of what you, you know, <coughs> what book you're going to be using in the spring or what we're going to be doing. Um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, the, the book in the spring, I am, I have one possibility and, and we'll, we'll have to see. I, I haven't checked it out in sufficient detail, though. It looks good on the surface, but I have to, I have to review it in a little more in-depth. All right. What's an interface? And I don't mean a GUI. What's a, a, a Java class-like uh, thing that's an interface? Anyone care to volunteer a definition? Okay. A template. Does anyone care to elaborate on that? Because in a way you could say that a class or, or a super class in a way is like a template that you could inherit from. But it's what specifically? It's a template basically that has no programming logic, has only signatures of methods and uh, some data that needs to be in 
Actually, it is, it is just methods, yeah. yeah. Uh, an interface, again, first of all, to describe it, an interface um, only has um, abstract methods in it. And by abstract, it means that anything that extends it, or not extends it, but implements the interface, has to fill in those. Uh, effectively, I think the Java textbook that we use says that an interface is a contract. All right? any, any class that wants to implement an interface has to implement the methods that are defined in the interface. All right? Why do we make interfaces? What is the big, what's the big win that we get from interfaces? Polymorphism. Um, does anyone care to define polymorphism or give a description of it? Poly meaning many, morphism meaning forms. Here's the way I think of it. And again, it is it's an analogy, so it's not going to be 100% accurate. But um, I, think it's, I think it's a decent analogy anyhow, at least a fair analogy. All right? If you get... If you buy a device that uh, is USB, right, it could be a camera, it could be a tablet, it could be a mouse, it could be a printer, it could be any of those things. As long as it has the right plug on it, it can get plugged into your computer through a USB port. All right? So by saying, and by saying that you have a device that's a USB device, you're saying that, yeah, it has the connections, all right? It has, is hooked up so that it could be wired to your computer using the USB cables and so on. So it's effectively a promise that you're going to support that standard and that you're going to have that functionality and that capability to be plugged in there. An interface and software is sort of the same thing, all right? Um, when you design a class that implements an interface, you are saying that, Whatever methods are defining, defined in the interface, you are going to implement. You're going to fulfill that contract that the interface has laid out. And you're going to have these methods. And why do you have these methods? So then you can plug that in anywhere that one of those is accepted. All right? So a silly example that I give in my Java class is there could be an interface of flying things. Okay? And maybe... Um, there's a couple methods on flying things, like um, get maximum height that it can fly, and get maximum speed that it can fly. All right, maybe that's the two methods: get maximum speed, get maximum height. All right. Now we could create a whole bunch of classes that implement those th that interface. A kite flies. A bird flies, an airplane flies, a rocket flies, you know, we could, uh, you know, certain insects fly, birds fly, and we could implement those interfaces, and the exact details of how it implements it doesn't matter to us as long as it implements it. So as long as every flying thing has a method for give me your maximum height, give me your maximum speed, then it can implement that interface. Now, in the case of an airplane, the maximum speed might be calculated based on what kind of fuel you use and how big the engines are and how many engines it has and all those sorts of things. There might be a big, long, involved calculation to say an airplane or a jet equip equipped in this manner can fly this fast. Whereas a bird, it might depend on uh, the species of bird, the, the age of the bird, the wingspan of the bird, and other things about the bird. Maybe you could come up with some rule to calculate the, the maximum speed uh, of a bird, and so on. So it can be calculated in wildly different ways. And again, that's why interfaces don't require any attributes. Because the attributes, the characteristics of a bird, is a lot different than the characteristics of an airplane. But they do have certain behaviors in common. Now. One reason that interfaces are desirable and popular is because with inheritance, you can only have one layer of inheritance. A class can only extend one superclass. But a class can implement a bunch of different interfaces. Also, 
inheritance? Java does not do multiple inher uh, inheritance. Right. Um, so therefore, if you have something that maybe you'd be thinking of multiple inheritance, you could do the inheritance for one and implement the interface. So for example, if we had a class for bird, that could inherit from the animal class, you know. And then it could implement the flying things class, all right. And that flying things interface could be implemented throughout our structure with vehicles, you know, because airplanes, with toys, because frisbees, you know, anything, regardless of where it appears on the inheritance chart and the structure chart, it can implement that interface, so it goes across that. The idea is sort of like this, that the win that you get from polymorphism, that is being able to write a function that, that, that accepts um, a flying thing class, any class that implements that, um, maybe not be quite as good as inheritance, but it's a lot simpler. Uh, you don't run into the dicey issues that you have with multiple inheritance about what if both uh, of the parents have a certain... Uh, certain uh, um, method on it, all right, and all that. And again, it's relatively easy and clean and, and lightweight uh, to implement, all right. Um, for example, you know, we could have, um, you know, if you think of a, a big store, all right, um, you know, there might be age-restricted items at the store, all right, uh, you know, like tobacco, alcohol, uh, Sudafed, all right, all the all the dangerous age, you know, age restricted items. Now, inheritance wise, those could be in a lot of different places on the inheritance chart. But if the you know you know, so it could be something like this. Let's say I'm a supermarket and I have the products. And I have um, tobacco products, beverages, I could have the age restricted interface get implemented by anything that has that. So our program that scanned those goods, you know, if it found any age restricted item, it could give that to a certain method and get some information about it. Like maybe what for tobacco the age is 18 for um, for uh, uh, alcohol it's 21 or whatever, all right. And again, you can implement a bunch of different sorts of interfaces, but you can uh, only extend one class. Now, what criteria do you use to? Um, what criteria do you use to determine whether you're going to extend something or implement an interface? In other words, how would you decide whether to make a bird, for example, um, you know, if we're coming up with that structure, we have animal, we have bird, and we have flying thing, how do you decide to say, well, a bird, you know, extends the animal class but implements the flying thing class? Why not the other way around? How would you make that decision? Yeah, the, the classic is the is a test, all right? And, you know, you, first of all, to see if it's a candidate at all, you ask the question, does this sentence make sense? A bird is a animal. Yes, that makes sense. The second one you would ask is, does a bird, is bird is a flying thing? And that's also true. So both those things are candidates to be either the superclass or, um, a, a interface that gets implemented. 
Um, typically what you do is you look for sort of the stronger is a relationship. All right. Seems to me that a bird is more like animals than it's like other things. A bird has some behaviors in common with flying thing, with other flying things, but a bird has a lot more stuff, both attributes and methods in common with animals than it has with flying things. There might be a couple of things in common for all flying things, but for all animals, all animals have a day it was born, all animals have an expected lifespan, all those sorts of things. When you extend, you have the ability and you gain the benefit of reusing code. So if I had a get birthday method up in the animal class, I wouldn't have to, you know, that probably would be the same for any animal. All right, it would just return the birth date or set birth date. So with inheritance, I get the benefit of reusing code. Um, you don't get the benefit of reusing code in, in, uh, with interfaces because, again, the interface only has abstract methods. That is, it only has the signature for those methods. But you do gain the benefit of polymorphism. All right? um, you have polymorphism and reused code with inheritance. You just get the polymorphism piece with, uh, with interfaces. Um, the is a test. Again, an example of where an is a test would fail is maybe you might think of feathers and say, hmm, maybe I make feathers the superclass of bird. I don't know, it's a bad idea, but that would fail the, the is a test, right? Because a bird isn't a feather, a, a feather isn't a bird, so you, those would not be in a, a subclass, superclass relationship. Now, there could be composition, a bird has feathers, so a bird class could be made up of an, you know, a bunch of instances of feathers classes, but uh, again, not, not in an inherent structure. All right. So I want to make sure we are clear on that because what we're, one thing we're going to look at today is going to be an example of an interface. Um, I posted some links at, uh, of examples and whatnot. I think there's a link to it. I think there's a link to it. All right. Responsiveness. All right. One method that, is, or one, one behavior that you see in Android applications from time to time is this application is not responding. What do you want to do? <laughs> All right. Uh, usually that happens when the application is off doing some big, um, big piece of functionality, big operation. And therefore, it's not responding to user interface things. It's not responding to gestures. You know, you click a button and it doesn't respond to that. I think somewhere down here it talks about the criteria for it. Yeah. No response to an input event within five seconds. Or a broadcast receiver hasn't finished executing within 10 seconds. So, Let's say we had an application that ran out to the internet and got some data, all right, and refreshed something. Something like a sports scoreboard, where it was constantly pulling the latest score, or like a stock ticker, or something like that, where our application would periodically run out, grab that information, and, and refresh that on the screen. All right. Now that's the kind of operation that we're talking about here that could affect the responsiveness of it. Because depending on your connection to the internet and depending on the server at the other end, well, there's just a lot of things that can go wrong. There's a lot of variables. All right? So if you're doing one of these kind of activities, it has a potential to take away from the user interface. How do you avoid getting this application not responding issue? How can you avoid getting that sort of issue, running into that sort of issue. Okay. 
Okay. So I would imagine so that you know, when you power up these lights, so correct me if I'm wrong here, they're on Mac, they're already fully installed, so that if you're going to use the application, you can do it for you. Okay. Um, um, that's definitely a, uh, th that, that sort of thinking is definitely good. The idea of having stuff running in the background. In, in terms of Java or Android, uh, when we talk about stuff running in the background, what is that called? Running a thread. Running a thread. All right. Running a thread. So threading, and we've seen some examples of threading, but we really didn't talk about it that much. That's why I wanted, that's one of the reasons that I thought this was probably better than spending time talking about overloaded methods and all that, because I think folks have that down. And if you don't, again, we can, we can talk about it at, at some point. You have a thread. What is a thread? Does anyone care to define a thread? A line of execution. That's a great statement. All right. Uh, good definition. Does anyone want to have their own add a definition to it? That's one of the things that differentiates it from a process. Okay. Is that it has uh, shared data. Okay. With other threads. You can share data with other threads. Right. Processes, you know, they're pretty much. They're right. Pretty much. They have ways. Right. You're stealing my notes here, because that was the next question. Not really a definition of thread. No, no. But that was the next question I was going to ask, is the definition between a thread and a process. And, and that gives us a good head start on that. The processes are more standalone. Yeah, right. Uh, a thread, again, is a line of, of execution that can happen sort of within a process. All right? And again, the question I was going to ask is the difference between a thread and a process. And in the case of, of in Java, each process is going to be seen like on the operating se uh, system as a process that is going to have an instance of a Java virtual machine. And its own little place of memory with a stack and all that. And it's not easy to share stuff between the two. Again, as was mentioned, you know, there's, there's ways to do everything. You know, there's ways to install Linux on your Xbox, right? So there's ways to get the processes to talk to each other, but it's a bigger deal. All right, it's a bigger deal. Think of a thread as being a line of execution. Have you trademarked that? If not, I might. No, actually, it's surprising because I really never worked Right. That happens within a process, and therefore it can have access to the same me uh, memory. So it can it can easily manipulate the, the same objects and share data and that sort of thing. On the scale of big deals, like how hard it is to do it, you know, processes are a bigger deal than threads. They're harder to do. Uh, they require more effort. They're 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 bigger things to create. They're harder to get them talking to each other, and so on. Threads are a relatively um, straightforward way to achieve effectively parallel processing, where two things are going on at the same time. Now, you know within a computer, all right, computer really, assuming that a single processing computer, to clarify that, with a single processor, the computer is only executing one instruction at a time, all right? Uh, but the computer rapidly switches between all the processes that are running, all right, to, to give them a little time slice, and it does that so quickly that from uh, on the human scale of time, it appears like that things are happening simultaneously. So if I'm composing an email and I have a Word document up that I'm typing in, and I have uh, iTunes playing and all these things happening, really, the CPU is rapidly rotating between those, executing um, each of them. The Java virtual machine works about the same way with threads. All right? So, the Java virtual machine within a process is going to be rotating among these threads, doing little bits of them at a time, and spreading the, spreading the processing power around. 
all right, to handle uh, each of the threads. So, getting back to my example, all right, if I had to run out and get some data from the internet, and I was concerned that that could take too long, all right, and my device then might not be responsive to my user, uh, user interface actions, all right, I could create a second thread for that. All right. um, the applications we've been looking at so far have been all single-threaded applications with a couple small exceptions, I will say that. We have, we have seen some multiple threading, but we have our application process has an instance of the Java virtual machine as one thread that, again, as the CPU loops through all its processes, the Java virtual machine, you know, executes that from beginning to end and does what it needs to do and so on. What we could do in the case of the long internet search is we could let that thread handle the UI and spawn another thread to do the pull data off web. And then the Java virtual machine, when it gets the processor's time, will switch between these two and pull it back and forth. Another word for this is that these things happen asynchronously. All right? Because that UI isn't sitting there waiting for the data retrieval to be done to continue. So, for example, if you were like refreshing a score in a sports application or a stock price or, or the weather information, you could go to other parts of the app while it was chugging around and then it might come back and, and, and refresh that. Where have we who have done web developers seen this concept before? That's a little bit of a curveball question. But what does this sound a little bit like? Or maybe the other way around. Maybe the other thing sounds like this. This sounds like Ajax to me, right? With Ajax, all right, same idea. The difference being is in Ajax, all right, uh, the browser actually sends the request for processing to the web server. So the web server is chugging around as opposed to the browser doing both threads itself. So in a way, uh, you know, as I was going through this, given that most of my recent experience has been in the web world, it's kind of like, well, this is kind of like Ajax within a single virtual machine because it's asynchronous, all right? So, that's the idea of threads, all right? Um, let's see. Here's a research about understanding Java threads and runnables from Java World. With a name like Java World, it has to be reliable. Independent path of execution. All right. Uh, understanding Java threads. There's a link uh, to this in Angel, if you want to if you want to pull it up that way. They have some sample code. We're going to look at a sample that I think is a little better to, to understand it. All right. Now, one problem. What's the, what's the problem that, that you could maybe anticipate with, with this? Runaway threads. Well, runaway threads. Just won't end. Okay, it just won't end. All right. Typically, uh, you, you would have the ability to, and I think in the sample... In one of the examples in here, I think the sample that we're going to look at, it like there's a catch in there to run as long as its parent is running. So if the parent, something happens to the parent, it's going to clobber that thread. But that, there's a potential for that. What are other, uh, what are, what's another potential issue? Deadlocks. Deadlocks, how so? Well, say for instance you're updating a record. Right. Say so you have two, two things updating a database. Mm -hmm. Right. 
uh, essentially what what was what uh, was described was was the issue of a, a deadlock like a database deadlock all right whereas two threads both are trying to access the same resources and one of them has it locked maybe one of them has resource a locked one of them has resource b locked the one that has b locked needs a to finish the one that has a locked needs b to finish they'll never finish they'll just sit there looking at each other like the um Oh, what was it in Dr. Seuss? The Sneetches, I think. The northbound and southbound Sneetch. They never move a step to the side, and they just stand there looking there, and they build a highway around them and, and all that. It really is it, it's one of my favorite stories. You should, that, that might, next time, you know, if I, if I ever have to miss class again, that will be an assignment somehow. I'll figure out a way to do it. Put that video on uh, the Android app, you know, for everyone to see. At any rate, in general, there's the same sort of concurrency issues that you would run into in databases. I'm not sure if, if you all had the, the 143 class, the database class. We talk a little bit about concurrency issues. Um, the other issue that relates to it is with simultaneous updates, you run the risk of like one thing interfering with what the other one's doing. So deadlock is sort of one flavor of that. Um, two things trying to do hit the same thing at the same time could kind of like mess things up. And they talk about this in the synchronization uh, portion of this article. I think. Let's see. They talk about critical code this talks about having a deposit and a withdrawal thread. And they show the sample output. And based on the effect, based or, or rather, um, uh, based on the fact that um, these two things are addressing the same variables, the same memory, you have some potential inconsistencies. Um, I'll leave that for you to read through the details of that. But again, effectively the problem is, is because they share stuff, they can mess up each other's work, you know, <laughs> in, in, in layman's terms. And not necessarily all of it, you know. Let's say you had an application that you could go and, and look at stuff um, and, uh, you know, while you, you know, and there's a thread in the background pulling the latest score of, of the Indians game, all right? Maybe those two threads don't interfere with each other, all right? In which case, it's not, there's not an issue. But if they are addressing the same things and, and hitting the same memory and hitting the same objects and so on, you run the risk of that. And they talk about the critical path in the programs or the critical code. Uh, that is the code that would lead to inconsistency. And they talk about what you can do to fix that, which is to, to uh, synchronize the code. Uh, this I don't think is in any of our examples, uh, but I did want to introduce this to you. Uh, the Java synchronization. Is that a class within Java? Actually, it's a statement. You can use the synchronized. Yeah. But they show an example of this one with this. Where they can put some criti critical code in here to synchronize this. All right. We might look at this in future examples. That We're not going to look at that today. All right. Is it, well, updating obviously is, is where it's going to manifest itself probably most critically. Um, any, anytime things are shared, though, you're, you know, and, and they're doing something with the same thing, um, you run the risk of, of interfering uh, with it. Um, I will have to look back. Um, I don't have it loaded on my laptop right now. I guess I could. I'm pretty sure that there's, there's a synchronized uh, command in the canon 
application just so that you couldn't do something like maybe you couldn't uh, like change the aim of the cannon while the thing is firing or something goofy like that. All right. I, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but I seem to recall seeing that in there. All right. Let's look at some of our, let's look at our examples um, for this. And the examples, again, I posted, there's a tutorial that goes with these examples that you can read through to get this fellow's take on it. We're using the threading examples. Part one and two, I don't know how far we'll get today, but um, I plan at some point at looking at, at all three of these. And then you can actually, in addition to the tutorial, you can actually download the source code to them. Which is really nice. Alright. Let's pull up the first one. Let's pull up the first threading example and take a look at it. All right. Oops. Got to switch over. All right, there we go. All right. Let me go and let me minimize these. It's so funny, when this plugs, plugs in, it changes my wallpaper. I don't know why it would do that, but it does. I have a very cute picture on my wallpaper, and that, that kind of burns me up. Me and my daughter vandalized Best Buy over the weekend. Um, we used the IMAX uh, camera to take a picture of ourselves, and then we used that to set the, the desktop wallpaper on it. So someone in Best Buy is going to come and see us on there. Then we took a picture of us looking, you know, standing next to that. So, long story. All right. So let's go and run this. It's doing its thing. All right, here we have this, and they have their little logo, and they have the earth sitting there. Now, when I touch it, up pops a little circle, I don't know if you can see it there, a little circle that has in it effectively a counter of, of milliseconds or something. I don't know, seconds since the application, maybe it's seconds since the application started, something like that. And as I press here, it shows the time of that. Press here, the time of that. So, how do we know that there's threading in this? What, what evidence do we see of threading in this? In other words, how would you know that there is multiple threads in this example? Little circle is is the indication of the time when I pressed it in, in milliseconds or in seconds, I think. So yeah, you see that one's 133, that one is 121. Uh, and, and actually when I press it again, it updates all of them to show the time that it was pressed. Oh, so the times are all the same? Yeah. So I, I missed that critical fact. Yeah, interestingly enough, they're not totally the same. Well, we can we can talk about that uh, as well. Yeah, because they're running. There, there's again, there's bouncing between the threads. There's there's. No, it does not. The bigger question, though, is how do we know there's some kind of threading going on here? I would guess that because the objects on the screen all 
Okay, maybe. Right, right. The way that we know that there's threading is this is doing two things. One is someone is counting in the background how many seconds have gone or whatever is counting. I forget what. So someone is counting and someone's updating that counter and someone is waiting for me to, to press the finger uh, on that to touch it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What would happen if we had a loop that was just counting in the same thread as that was handling the finger touch? Well, we might get lag, we might touch it, and if it's in that loop, counting however long it is, it might not respond right away or whatever. All right. So this is clear, clearly doing two things. There's a thread that's, that is handling the UI, and there's a thread that is counting. All right. So let's look at the code and and see. Yeah, go ahead. Conceivably, it could be, but the reason I know it is is because there's no like interference between the two. In other words, there's no lag when I touch that, where it's off running doing something else. There's a counter. It would, it would basically block. Yeah, it would block it. Would block it. everything you're trying to do. Though. Right. Because it's, it's waiting for that to counter. While it was in the counter, let's say the counter counted 10 seconds, for example. All right. During those 10 seconds, if I touch the screen, you know, it, it, would, it, would, it would not be responsive. All right, because it's busy doing other stuff. And possibly, too, with all the touch points, they would take the same information. Is that a sign of multi-threaded? The fact that they all have a counter that can, uh, the, the, that's running that can update, yeah. I, I suppose that's a sign. The, the fact that they're all the same probably isn't so much uh, a sign. All right, let's look at the code. All right, so here we have this, blah, blah, blah. We have our there we go. Here we have our activity, sort of the main thread, all right, and it contains a threading view, all right. This does similar to what we did in the, um, oh, I forget what example, where we used the custom view uh, to have the stuff. When this starts, what this does is it sets the content view to that custom view that we have down there, the, the, uh, threading view, and it starts the counting thread. All right. Now, if you notice, that class, where is it? Threading view is a view and it implements runnable. All right. That's why we had the discussion about interfaces earlier. All right. In other words, this by implementing the runnable, this allows this class to run as a thread. All right. Now, when you implement runnable, let's go. Let's go and see what the runnable interface consists of. Um, uh, in an in, in inner class, yeah. Yeah. Let's look. Um,
All right, public interface runnable. So runnable is an interface. All right. That gets around the fact that we have this thing that we want to both be a view and run as a thread. All right, that's sort of a critical thing there. Remember, we don't have multiple inheritance. What is the method it needs to implement? Run. <laughs> it's the only implement, uh, only thread, oh, I'm sorry, only method that this needs to be to implement. So, let's go and look. It has all its other stuff, right? It has all the other stuff associated with it. But somewhere down here, it has a run. And what this run does is, as long as the main thread is not interrupted, it's going to sit there and it's going to count 250 milliseconds. So I guess it's counting quarter of a second. All right. And so it sleeps for a quarter of a second, then it increments that ticker, which is an attribute of the threading view. All right. So it, uh, it increments that every quarter of a second. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. This is this is uh, this is trying to keep um, prevent the runaway thread. So, in other words, if the main program is not running, then it's not going to go and do that. So this guy doesn't sit in in just loop endlessly. All right. Yeah. Right. If something were to happen, if you know, if we were to pause execution or whatever. All right. So, what do we want to look at first? Let's look at the on touch event. All right. The on touch event on action down, it creates a point, grabs the x and y of the position of where it was touched. And it adds to M counter position a point. Okay, what is M counter position? It is a list of these point objects. All right, an array list of point objects. So, on the touch event, every time we touch it, all right. It grabs the coordinates of where we touched it and adds it to the um, array list of the points that we've touched before. All right. Now remember, this is happening asynchronously from the counter. That counter's still chugging in the background. All right. Um, then it says invalidate. What does that mean? What does that do? Any guesses? This confused me, but I kind of eventually figured it out. Invalidate on a view forces the on draw method to fire off. So in other words, when I've clicked it, I've added a new point, so I better redraw the screen. So that invalidate function, or that invalidate uh, uh, statement, yeah, method, causes the on draw event to fire off. All right, or the on draw method. No, it's a method, uh, it's a method on a, um, apparently on a view or a image view. So I didn't define the method invalidate. Yeah, go and redraw. So, now, what does the redrawing look like? 
Well, you know, um, the details of this are less important. You know, you can look at them. What it does is it loops through the array list. So as long as there's something in the array list, it's going to loop through all the points and it's going to effectively draw the circle on the canvas in the right position and it's going to update the innards of it with M ticker. M ticker being the thing that is being counted and being incremented every quarter of a second. All right. So to answer the question of when I touch this, all right, you might expect all those numbers to be the same, all right, but they're not, all right. This one is 3116, 3111, 3108, 3113. Why are they not the same? This. Yeah, yeah. It is going, that Java virtual machine is bouncing between those two threads. This thread which is drawing and this thread which is counting. Right. And therefore going back and forth, all right, the Java virtual machine bounces between the two. It's being fair. It's given each, each time. All right. So it draws a few, lets the ticker run to keep counting. Draws a few. So it's bouncing between those. So the effect is, is by the time, as this loop here is executing, I swear sometimes I think I need a few extra hands here, but as this loop is executing, all right, through the iteration of the loop, through one call to this on draw event, all right, this variable here is changing because that other thread is continually updating it as this guy's doing its thing. This thread's doing its thing. So they're generally times that didn't play are close. Yeah. Exactly so let's see what the biggest difference the is. Second or yeah. Let's let's close this. Let's restart this. Oh, good. Advanced tax tax killer. All right. Let's run this guy again and let's make some observations. Okay. All right. I'm going to deliberately press going down the screen. All right. So that the ones on the top are the oldest ones, the ones on the bottom are the newest ones. So let's make some observations. That's 81. Let's go down a little bit further. That one's 97. That one's 98. Makes sense that this one has a lower number than that one, right? All right. Because, yeah, it's, 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 in a, it's in a lower position in the array, lower element. We go here, 160, 161, 162, 172, 173, 174. That's apparently not, unless they hit, yeah, it's only because, yeah, it's a, so, all right. So that's about it on this example, all right. Um, 
Let's start the other example, and we'll see how far we get, the second example. We won't be able to get to the third example today, but we should be able to get to the second example. All right, let's look at the second example. Oh, this is a good one. All right. I hit that. Notice what it's doing. It's counting as it's going. And boom, I hit that. That one's counting. So each one of them doesn't just get updated uh, when, they, when they're created uh, and, and when it's redrawed. It gets updated continuously without even, even me doing anything. I think one's faster than the other, but you're going to need better eyes than me to tell. <laughs> it, it doesn't look quite simultaneous, but yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of hard to tell. So is the quarter of a second pause is not in this? Well, well let's, let's think what's going on here. All right. What's going on here is, all right. Let me close this other stuff. Well, let's take a look. I got to be careful with this because all these have, like the classes are almost the exact same name, so I got to be making sure we're looking at the right class. I don't know. We'll find out, huh? <laughs> All right. Uh, let's look at this. All right. Yeah. I'll do like uh, I'll do like uh, uh, what's his name Fermat in Fermat's last theorem. He he came up with a theorem. Then he he wrote in the margin. It's like I will you know. I don't have enough space in the margin to do the proof. I'll leave that to the reader to do. And a lot of people speculate he had no clue how to solve it. He just wrote that in there kind of like, you know, yeah. So, yeah, I'll leave that for you to, to, to figure out. All right, let's look at this. All right, let's see the similarities uh, of this. Again, we have the activity, uh, just like before. Um, we have the custom view, just like before. We do the same things when it creates. All right. We, we have our thread view that also implements runnable so that it can be run as a thread. Now the difference here is I think there's just the one tiny difference. Yeah. We're using a handler. But what we're doing is this sits here and waits. Actually, it sleeps only, for, uh, let's see, that would be 50 milliseconds, which is how much in real time? Uh, It'd be five hundredths, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. All right. So it, it sleeps for a short period of time, for one. What happens when it wakes up? It increments the ticker. Then, all right, it looks to see if there's anything in that array list, which it can do, right, because it's the same class, right? So it can share that data because this class is you know, the, the, the thread is this class. So it can look to see if there's anything in that array. If there is anything in that array, all right, it sends a message to 
the handler that says, go ahead and update. So it sends a notification back to that thread that says, hey, something has changed, go and update. Yes, sends a message to the UI thread. And that UI thread has a handler to handle the message and it looks to see if that message is an update message and if it is an update message it uh, it uh, yeah it, it, it calls the invalidate method and, and, and repaints. So the runnable, the runnable is an inner part of the thread interface? Or the, 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 the run is an interface? The, 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 the runnable is an interface and this class implements that, correct. Correct. Right. Right. Because this class both implements runnable and is the view. All right. So, in other words, what I've allowed this object to do is run in two threads. The UI, you know, the, the UI waiting for the touch event and the, um, the, uh, the counting method. But the handler is a, a property of the view? Of the view, correct. Correct. Because it's telling it to give me Correct. something, the parameters I'll type that. Right. Exactly. Um, where is that? Right, there. right here. Right yeah. You wouldn't be able to start that thread if that class wasn't a uh, implement the runnable. Right. Now, question. We're not going to do this. But. How would we change this? I'll try to get all this code up here at the same time. How would we change this that maybe when the counter hit, right, the counter is at 8,000, 8,900. How could we change this? How could we change this so when it hit 10,000, it erased everything? Okay, where? Where it's uh, incrementing the ticker. Okay. You can evaluate the ticker at that point. Okay. I don't mean wipe the ticker, ticker out, I mean wipe the, the circles out. You can wipe the circles. Wipe the circles out, yeah. Erase your array or initialize your array and put an empty array. Yeah. But how, what's the mechanism by which I would do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's what I'm. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. I probably would send a message back to the 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 in uh, the interface. Yeah, um, yeah, it does. We own the array list. That's our privately declared variable. It's not part of the array list. I mean, not part of the view per se. Yeah, here's the view. Just like here's the array list. Tick, and, and ticker. The thread's updating it, but it is it is an attribute of the view. All right, let's go and let's do. Right, 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 right. Yeah, let's go. 
Let's do this. Let's make message clear. All right. We'll give it a value of two. And we won't do we won't do ten thousand because we don't want to sit here another hour. All right. It did it did turn over to ten thousand, by the way. Alright. Yeah. We'll do we'll do Yeah, we'll do uh <laughs> We'll do, uh, yeah, we'll do 500, let's say. All right. So what I can do is I can say if if am ticker greater than 500, I'm going to create a message, message clear, fire that message off and then I could put a case up here that says if it's message clear I want to do what? I want to set the ticker back to zero, right? I almost forgot to do that. Otherwise, otherwise it would just be clearing itself each time. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be a disappearing as soon as this. Well, you know what this is. This is this is a case of, uh, you know. Any fans of the original Star Trek is hearing Scotty's voice uh, at this point. I don't think it can take it much longer, Captain. Because <laughs> uh, this, this is like probably a six or seven year old machine. So this is, this, you know, yeah, it's not going to take it. Yeah. Uh, do you know the guy who played Scotty was like a war hero or something? I mean, he was, he was like a tough guy, you know, apparently. But anyhow. In World War II, I believe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, M ticker equals zero, and I want to clear the array list. So I will say M counter positions dot no IntelliSense. Oh, yep. Yeah. All right, clear. There we go. All right, so drum roll, please. Should be all there is to it. Knock on wood. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I have as well. So yeah, yeah I, I know the transition.
Um, it is griping with me when I try to run. Oh, there we go. All right. So there we click it, and it's chugging, it's chugging, it's chugging, it's chugging. When it gets to 500, it should clobber it. Okay, so what are you suggesting? Well, I mean, for, yeah, like the said, in, without sending so, so, uh, Do you mean to set M ticker? Yeah, you have to uh, set M ticker in the same thread. Okay, so you're saying set this down here. Right after you send a message? Okay. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Fair enough. That way that's keeping that's that's keeping having two threads updating that variable. So we're run, we we will avoid the potential conflicts. Yeah. So there we go, and it will still so in other words, the, the main thread is responsible for the uh, array, and the other one is responsible for the ticker. The main thread. The main, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's why, yeah, this code is in here to clear it out, because if we touch it, this that's the thread that, that goes and adds to it. No, this is handler its own thread. I don't think handler is its own thread. Yes. Right. All right. So I posted your next assignment, and it's real simple, um, but you can have fun and play with it. I, I strongly encourage that. Oh, I do, I do have a word about our assignment. Uh, um, it was mentioned that we didn't cover the tone generator class. Uh, that was by design, all right? Uh, you know, as much as we try, we can't cover everything, all right? So therefore, I wanted to just give practice of, okay, Here's something we didn't cover. Let's say you want to do it. Now, granted, that's a junky class with, with junky sounds. All right? It's not particularly good sounds. But the exercise was to go in and to look at the Java docs and to figure out how to use it and, and do that. So that was kind of by design. I guess if you made sounds other ways, I'm not going to complain too much. But that was the purpose of, of, uh, uh, of that. But essentially what you're going to do is you're going to uh, add a clock that's going to display the time continuously uh, on, your, on your Java sound toy that is due, I guess, today or Thursday. Oh, for the next. Yeah, for the next assignment, yeah. So if you want an extra challenge, I always like the extra challenges. Um, you know, I, I took, for a long time, I took yoga classes. And whenever you would do one pose, like you think, oh, I got that down, then then make it harder, right? It's like, they can't, can't let you be happy, right? So if you want an extra challenge on this, go in and add an alarm, all right? So in other words, so that you could put a time in the text box, and then when that is hit, play some sort of sound, all right? And then you could add a stop to, you know, have fun with that if you want to do that more. That's not a requirement, but again, if you want to, um, expand on the original assignment, feel free, feel free to do that. 
And we'll, the quiz will be next week, correct? This Thursday, not, next week. not this Thursday, but the next Thursday. And it'll probably be the same format where you'll have essentially over the weekend to do it. It'll be online. So, so, so reading for this week is all the Java review? Yeah, scan through those sections of the Java review that are on the syllabus. Um, but it's my sense that you folks have a pretty good grasp on that. But scan through just to see if there's something that, that maybe, maybe you're not sure of. All right, and, and bring, bring that to class um, on Thursday. All right. Uh, let no, I, I think it was to, to set the volume. Yeah. Yeah. Um, finally, create a menu option to allow the selector selection of the volume. All right. What that what I mean is there should be a menu option to say like like whoops. Um, you know, you could do like average or loud, normal, quiet, or something like that. If I'm not mistaken, on the tone generator class, there is a. Oh, I hate I hate when I'm not on Chrome because I can't. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there is. Uh, Yeah, on the class, yeah, to use the tone generator, yeah, you can set a volume yeah, for that. Well, your menu selection could could create a new instance of it with the new volume setting. Depends how you code it, but yeah, that's right. No, no, no. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, I was I was a little bit. Yeah. Fair enough, I was a little vague on that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I'll admit I was vague on that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, whatever you do, I'm going to say I wanted, I wanted something else, right? So I'll wait to see what you guys do, then I'll say no, I meant, I should have turned off the camera, so, so you, get, you got it on tape now that, that uh, what I said. Um, it is funny because I was playing with this in my uh, in my lab uh, in my lab for another class and like I I don't know but I was playing around and I like cranked the volume on it and it just blasted the class and it was like oh you know <laughs> we'll yeah oops yeah never mind never mind don't pay attention. Well, it's interesting. It's like I have no idea what most of the tones. Are. These are like standard phone tones. Yeah. You would, yeah. You'd have, you'd have to know what. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, like what this is is this is a key. This is a tone. If you press like a zero on a keyboard, like if or not a keyboard, the keypad. Like so, when you dial a zero, you hear, eh, you know. But you're, but you're, when you're dialing a touch tone phone, that, that's how it actually does the communication. Right. But it does do other kind of tones too. It does like the default alert tone, and 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 some other tones. Yeah.
Is that what Wozniak and, and uh, Wozniak uh, uh, was like? Was his first hacking thing is making devices to? Oh, I'm not gonna talk about that. Yeah, not going to talk about it. Right, right. But yeah, if I'm not mistaken, that that was among their first <laughs> forays in the en engineering. Yeah, is is. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I forget. I forget what it's called. All righty.